significant progress is there and also the investments are there. So that's clearly the way to go. And it's fascinating to be able to accompany the society to go this way. From EE Tech Media and All About Circuits, this is Moore's Lobby. I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanoff. In 1977, solar panels cost $76 per watt. Today, it's a couple dozen cents. and It seems like all my neighbors are sticking them on the roof. It's normal now to use solar power, but only thanks to researchers who have been working on this technology for decades, long before it was feasible. We have one of those folks today in the lobby, Dr. Peter Wawer, the division president of green industrial power at Infineon. He's a leader in the world of renewable energy, but also has some history working on flash memory and DRAM, so you know we got to geek out on that too. Peter, thanks for being here today. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm curious, how did you first get excited about engineering and technology? So I studied electrical engineering many, many years ago. So I finished in the 90s, and I think that was basically how I ended up in the semiconductor industry. During my electrical engineering studies, I was somehow connected to semiconductors. And uh, I was somehow fascinated by the world of, of semiconductors and what it's possible to do. And I think it's often also connected to the, to the teacher, right, to the professor. Actually, two professors which really made me curious about this topic and um, presented it in a very fascinating way. It's, it's close to material science, close to physics, close to electrical engineering, of course. And that is how, how I came here, basically. On this podcast, we see a lot of folks who have engineering running in their family. Is that true for you as well? Yeah, indeed. So my, my father was the first electrical engineer. And uh, now um, I'm <laughs> be the second, so to say. And one of my sons is also studying electrical engineering. So, yeah, <laughs> it's a family affair, so okay. to say, at least now for the third generation, maybe upcoming. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I understand you have a PhD. Can you tell me what you studied and what was hot at the time? Basically, even during school times, I was fascinated by the fact that the sun is able to generate electricity by converting the energy with help of a solar cell. Um, simply directly converting heat or photons into electricity. And then I, I being, being interested and learning about physics, semiconductor physics, it was the obvious way to look into this um, a bit more deeply. And when my studies came to an end, I had uh, the ability to do a PhD study, uh, which started in the beginning of the 90s, precisely 1993. That was at that point funded by uh, Siemens Solar. Actually, I think nobody knows today that at that point in time, Siemens Solar was the biggest solar cell manufacturer globally. Of course, compared to today, very moderate output volumes, but, but nevertheless. And they were looking for some PhD students. So I applied and, and I luckily succeeded in, in get the funding. And so I worked on this topic for a couple of years. What was the cultural perception of photovoltaic cells at that time? I think it was a pure research topic. Everybody knew that thick film solar cell are a reliable source of energy conversion, of course, way too expensive at that point in time, 30 years ago now from today's perspective. And the big thing was thin film. But the thin film also at that point in time until in certain areas today was suffering from the reliability issues. So Siemens also at that point in time was keen on in increasing the efficiency, bringing down overall costs of the solar cell. So the subject was then to look for potential to massively increase the co conversion efficiency of thick film solar cells. And that was a topic of my PhD work. So there were a couple of publications which told and tried to convince there are record-breaking efficiency gains possible based on thick film solar cell. And my task was to double check if there's something behind um, or not. Can you explain the difference for folks who aren't familiar, the difference between thick films and thin films? Basically, the, the thick film solar cell is, is made from wafers sliced from silicon. So silicon crystals are grown, then they're sliced, and that's also, by the way, the same procedure how you generate wafers from 
microelectronics, uh, silicon manufacturing. But in this case, you slice them a bit thinner and then you generate a PN junction by a thermal process and then you have the diode. And the diode is then an aerial diode where the sun is being collected and the energy from the sun is being transformed into electricity. That's the traditional thick film typically or to 100% consisting out of silicon, crystalline silicon. The thin film process means that you have only a couple of micrometers and the substance is typically glass. So you deposit um, material, can be also silicon, and then we talk about amorphous silicon. You deposit the semiconductor material from a gas phase, micrometer thick layers, also generating the PN junction, and then you immediately have it connected to the glass, which is then the substrate carrier. Then you cover it, of course, and of course you need to also include the, the contacts that is done with laser grooving and also the position technologies. So in principle, thin film technologies was at that point still the assumption have a tremendous cost down potential and of course also efficiency potential. But until today, we must confess that now, meanwhile, uh, the PV industry has grown to very, very substantial size that still the industry is being dominated by thick film, traditional thick film silicon technology, while still there exists also sizable thin film suppliers, but dominating material until today, silicon thick film. Is that mostly just due to efficiencies and cost? Yes. Yes. I definitely want to circle back to solar, but first, I can't help but notice you've been on quite the roller coaster of, let's call it corporate organizational gymnastics. As part of that, I understand you were around for the birth of Infineon. What were you working on there? When I actually finished my PhD, I realized that Siemens decided to step out of the solar business. And it was in the end of the 90s where I had to look for a job. Due to obvious reasons, I had a background in, in semiconductors. I was looking around then also at semiconductor manufacturers. And so I finally succeeded uh, to get a job in development um, at the semiconductor division of Siemens at that time. And while I started then end of 97, only two years later, it was announced that Siemens would now had decided and would now start to spin off the semiconductor division into a separate legal entity, which became then Infineon. And that was basically without doing anything um, the first time when I changed my employer because due to the spin-off name change, but I actually did not change anything regarding my job. So okay. that is how I basically went into this kind of transi transition job-wise, company-wise, while in the first phase, I was still the technology development in technology development for embedded flash technologies at, at Siemens and also Infineon. So Flash is ubiquitous. What was the development in the early days of that like? Yeah, embedded flash technologies are being used, of course, since a couple of decades. And, and the usage is there that you have typically a microprocessor. In this case, we had basically two applications. Uh, that was one of for um, chip card security controllers, which you have um, also in your today's chip and credit cards for ensuring safe transactions of your payments. And the other application at that point in time was a microcontroller where you need also a small embedded memory. And that was, I would say, very, very good learning for me because also at that point in time, we were the first team developing such kind of a technology in an environment which was used to memory because the site in Dresden where my professional career started was specialized on memory development at that point in time. But the company decision was also to enlarge the footprint, technology footprint of the site. So we belong to the first time, the first team then developing these kind of embedded memory technologies, which basically had only little reuse from the existing memory, which was running in, in the majority of the fab. I understand you're also involved in DRAM. Can you break down the difference between flash and DRAM and Kind of what happened to DRAM as an industry? Yeah, okay. The DRAM history is also an interesting one um, because DRAM is basically uh, the reason, the DRAM idea is basically the reason how and why Intel was founded, that you overcome the limitations of electromechanical storage 
magnetic storage with help of semiconductors. And that was in the end of the 60s, when, when finally the idea was to use a volatile memory named dynamic random access memory named DRAM to use a capacitor and a select transistor to store bits, electrical data. And due to the ongoing improvements of uh, semiconductors, of course, the amount over the uh, years and decades increased to tremendous densities, reducing the cost per stored bit, and which enables all these nice electronic gadgets that we use today. But as the name, name says, dynamic, a random access memory, uh, the information is volatile, meaning that um, you need to refresh the information. And when, when you switch the device off, the information is gone and you have to then again load it if you want to make use of the device, meaning your computer or your mobile phone. But of course, as we all know, we would love to take photos and also store data, which is non-volatile, meaning stays ideally forever. And with, as we know, usually the magnetic disk was capable to store huge amount of data at a reasonable price being used, of course, also first in computers and later on when the thing became smaller, even also in mobile devices. But still, it's not very elegant to, to use the magnetic disk because it's not very robust regarding vibration and shock resistance. Due to the ongoing improvements in microelectronics, um, now two decades ago, roughly, starting in the 90s, it was possible to store also non-volatile non -volatile data um, on semiconductor devices. And that was basically how Flash was invented. If I'm not mistaken, the first Flash ideas came from Toshiba. Hmm. Um, and the NAND Flash was then the device which pro provided a tremendous shrink potential, meaning on the same piece of silicon, you could cram more and more bits in a non-volatile way. And with the advent and yeah, with the with the upcoming handset and smartphone industry, of course, that was a huge opportunity then, then to make use of the capabilities to store pictures, photos, but of course also other data in a non-volatile way. You said DRAM essentially is a select transistor and a capacitor. What's the underlying technology for flash? How does it work? So the flash um, has typically a floating gate. I mean, there is always there are different flavors, but I would say at that point, the main main approach at that point in time was the floating gate. That's also true for, for embedded flash technology until today, where you basically have an, a conducting layer of typically polysilicon, which is completely encapsulated by insulator, either being silicon dioxide or a combination of oxide and nitrides. And the tricky thing is now that through the oxide, you're able, by applying a higher voltage than the typical read voltage, you're able to charge this cell or decharge the cell. And while charging or decharging the cell, you basically alter the amount of electrons and that changes the onset voltage of this transistor. And with this um, and an appropriate um, electric circuitry, you're then able to detect if the cell is charged or uncharged, and that translates the thing into a zero, a digital zero or a digital one. And if you go to the higher sophisticated level, then you charge various levels inside the same physical cell. And so you increase the number of bits per cell. And that was, of course, then another way mm. to improve the cost position, cost per bit. That's the way how to measure the productivity. Sure. And then in recent years, the evolution of technology even went further because typically these NAND cells are put on the wafer surface, but the very recent developments and the leading non-flash manufacturers of the world, like for example Micron or Samsung, were then capable to introduce the so-called vertical NAND. And they're very fascinating. You basically turn the whole cell to the vertical dimensions. And simply by, by adding more and more layers on the wafer, you increase the amount of programmable bits. And while when I started the engagement in the flash, a typical flash, leading flash device had something like one gigabit of data, 
Um, I just looked it up um, for this call. Today, you can even um, buy devices up to one terabit. So even by a factor of 1,000, wow. the density increased in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, which is, again, an extremely impref- impressive number regarding how productivity works in, in the semiconductor environment. It, it makes sense to just stack it up vertically. <laughs> it's such a simple fix, but I'm sure the technical complexity is, is, is hard to wrap my head around. Yeah, it sounds extremely simple, but I think to overcome these <laughs> hurdles uh, typically takes a couple of years of R&D and a lot of money. On that subject, I want to talk about Infineon spinning off the memory business, but it's time for a quick break. We'll be right back. Today's episode is sponsored by EBV's podcast, Passion for Technology. Techies, watch out. The new podcast, Passion for Technology, is dedicated to the latest technologies, trends, and applications in the electronics industry. Listen to the latest episodes about silicon carbide and gallium nitride, motor control, analog and power, and EV charging. Tune in now to dive into the world of semiconductors. To make sure you don't miss an episode, follow EBV's Passion for Technology podcast on your favorite platform. And if you like it, they love a positive rating. But for now, check it out and enjoy. And we're back with Dr. Peter Vavar, president of Industrial Power Control at Infineon. Peter, before the break, you mentioned that memory development takes a lot of time and money, and Infineon ended up spinning off the memory business into its own entity. How do people respond to that? I would say there was not, not a real general sentiment. It was a mixed thing because having then a larger entity is perceived from, from a couple of people as an advantage, more critical mass, um, more diversity. And of course, on the other side, being more focused, being dedicated, uh, being able to exactly focus on the things you know and you like has also certain advantages. So I would say from the hardcore memory folks, it was rather appreciated to go this way. Why I would not say that this was the opinion of each and everybody. So a bit mixed emotions. Yeah. But for those people being convinced of the things they do, I think it was also very much appreciated from quite a couple of people. That's a good set of perspectives. I'd like to talk flash technology a little more. What's it like to be constantly driving the size of these things down? I think we're down to like five nanometers. Yeah, to be honest, uh, to to really tell you this story until five nanometer, I, um, I wouldn't dare to. But uh, of course, the general principle, because I exited at 45 nanometer. Um, the thing is, uh, of course, always very fascinating from a technology perspective. The NAND flash, as we were a late entrant into the, the flash arena, the NAND flash turned out to be, of course, a tricky thing, as always, if you're at the leading edge. And so you need to shrink and bring the cell size down and to simply reduce cost per bit. And at that point in time, when we were doing this job, we had to learn how to integrate the multi-bits into a cell. Because typically, a flash cell consists of charge. And the charge simply alters then the threshold voltage of the device and either the cell is loaded or not loaded, meaning to be translated in a zero or one in a digital way, rather simple. Okay. The tricky thing is, of course, that you can then think about putting multi-levels into such kind of cell. For this purpose, you have to be very precise regarding measuring the voltage status. You talk only for a very small cell about a couple of electrons. So that was one challenge by its own. Hmm. to, of course, then be able to even get more information into a single data bit, meaning a physical cell. While at the same time, of course, you need to shrink from generation to generation the size of the cell, the the challenge becomes even bigger. And I think we we brought uh, some devices to the market, but unluckily, before we could be successful in increasing the business to a significant amount of of revenue, the world financial crisis hit us in 2009. And that was, of course, then the reason why Kimonda had to file bankruptcy to go for Chapter 11. So Kimoda files bankruptcy, and then you find yourself at Q-Cells. 
back into the solar, solar world. Can you tell me about that transition and what you were doing there? I think that was, of course, then a big, how to say, a big break regarding my career, right? Having uh, the issue that uh, the company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, to be honest or to be precise, uh, it, it didn't happen overnight, right? So um, the financial crisis kicked in. It was very clear that the whole economy is in very difficult waters and specifically semiconductors and memory. So I didn't wait until the very end, but I was already looking around. And in the meantime, as already said, the, the PV industry had developed to a really sizable industry, having also significant positive momentum at that point in time. We talk now about the time frame 2008, 2009. And so I was, due to my heritage, my, my PhD background, I was looking for opportunities. And, and luckily, I also found some some old colleagues from mine who were um, around in this industry and I reached out and I had the opportunity to join um, one of the leading manufacturers at that point in time, still exists today in a different setup, um, Q-Cells, and I took over there also the technology development department. So based on my experience, um, I had then fun to develop uh, the latest and greatest generation of um, high-performance solar cells silicon thick film solar cells and bring cell and module to the highest level of efficiency at reasonable cost, of course. What was it like coming back into that world after spending a few years in Flash? It was big fun yeah, because it was completely different. So solar cell compared to memory and um, semiconductor devices are rather simple. We, we talk about a PN diet. But of course, in, if you look into the details, it is not as simple as it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> and we saw a huge amount of potential to bring those devices to the next level regarding efficiency and of course, then also reducing cost. So it was a very different environment, but of course, a huge opportunity also to leverage my know-how and, and the background regarding how to realize and bring innovative ideas into manufacturing. So I think we succeeded in doing some great things because we saw that there's a lot of upside regarding efficiency and how to boost the performance either on the cell side and also on the module side, because in the end, it's the module, the completed module that you install on your roof. So meaning anti-reflective coating, um, mm -hmm. adding additional features on, on the electricity, boosting the efficiency of the solar cells. These were the things we, um, we had to tackle. If I look back until today, a couple of those things is still in manufacturing and has tremendously improved the cost position of PV-generated energy. So looking at where you've been and what you've done, you've clearly been through some hard times and worked in some very ultra-competitive markets, and you didn't always end up on top. What have you learned and taken away from those experiences? I would say um, you should be not fool yourself. <laughs> you need, it's, mm. it's of course, obvious statement, but <laughs> if the competitive environment is against you out of boundary conditions that you cannot influence, for example, in a very much price-driven environment, you have certain boundary conditions like energy prices, like access to material at a certain cost, which are simply non-competitive, then better change your strategy and adapt accordingly quickly and not be too optimistic that you will survive somehow. So I think um, in tech industry, always innovation matters a lot. And you need to be, if you're not a cost leader, you need to be innovation leader. But you should be very aware how your competitive environment looks and what you can achieve and what we can't achieve. Uh, the tricky thing is that hindsight is always very clear. When you're in the middle of the situation, <laughs> it's typically not too clear. <laughs> but you should yeah. find ways um, there to also reflect and, and, um, and see what is doable and what is not doable. Um, the beauty about tech is that it changes, it can change quickly. And of course, often innovation helps to change it. And so you need always to understand um, what the mega trends are, where the things are heading, and how your expertise, how your competence fits to it. And if it's a nice fit, and if you have a competitive edge, then you simply go for it and make 
all out of it that you can. And if not, better run away and do something else. That's good advice. So in 2012, you came back to Infineon. What brought you back there? Yeah, actually, um, again, also old connections, relations. Um, you typically make friends um, with colleagues and you know what's going on. And it was nothing why I ran away, right? Yeah. So it was basically, as we described, a kind of sequence of things that happen in business life. So therefore, I always had the good memories to those uh, times and I simply reached out. And again, there was an opportunity, which I took. And in this case, it was then becoming head of operations of one of the four Infineon divisions. And at that point, uh, named PMM, today it's PSS, Power Systems and Sensors. And here they were looking for um, operations, head of operations. And um, as it turned out, then a bit later, I also became head of technology. So technology and operations kind of mixture, uh, kind of a divisional COO, CTO role. And the, the beautiful thing, also until today, very exciting thing is that in the area of power semiconductors, they're aware and there are huge growth opportunities. So it was, again, a very good fit, I would say regarding existing competence of the team, of the company, and market opportunity. Speaking of opportunity, you were part of the acquisition of International Rectifier, which was like a $3 billion deal. Pretty big on the tech side as a technology leader in that space. How did you go about combining those technologies and what did that merger and acquisition look like from a technical and engineering perspective? Yeah, that was a very, very interesting experience. Um, as said before, our experience so far was to spin off certain parts of the business. At that point in time, we changed the roots of the game, so to say, and decided to, to go for this acquisition. And indeed, as you correctly say, it was the biggest acquisition done so far by our company. And I think we were very humble. Um, we were convinced that that would be a good idea. And it turned out to be a good idea. But we were humble and um, thought it through carefully, I would say. But in the end, the execution was successful. It was considered to be excess, excess success internally on our side, but of course also on the capital market side, where you as a stock-based company are always measured against, right? Yeah. So overall, um, the integration went nice. Also, the synergies we, we thought of uh, turned out to become true. So it was a good fit. Uh, in a multitude of dimensions, also regarding technology and even more important regarding skilled people and also strengthening our footprint in the Americas. So overall, I think a pretty good experience, exciting and, and successful in the end. And still some of those uh, former International Rectifier colleagues, uh, quite a couple of them are with us. And I think it was a great learning for the team. And we grew, grew together, being even a bigger and a more successful company. What sort of technologies were you working on and what sort of customers were you working with at that point? What were they doing? In certain areas, we were head-to-head -head competitors. So definitely <laughs> MOSFET and also IGBT technologies. This were the area where we had uh, quite an overlap regarding portfolio. But also here from the industrial logic, if you add one plus one, it can become even uh, larger than two. Yeah. Um, not very mathematical, but due to the <laughs> economy of scale and the nonlinear effects, if you're, the, you're then able to fill more manufacturing capacity, you're able to reduce cost and become more competitive. And as you may be aware that we were also the first guys uh, entering into the 300 millimeter manufacturing for silicon power devices, MOSFETs and IGBT. Here we could leverage a very nice synergy also with the additional volume and of course also competence in product development from, inter from International Rectifier. We could simply accelerate the economy of scale in the area of silicon based power devices. Not also to forget uh, the competence in the area of white band gap, especially gallium nitride which we also inherited from International Rectify to a certain extent. Well, that was timely because I have been hearing a lot over the last couple of years about gallium nitride and wide band gap semiconductors. Who is, who is using those and, and why, what's the advantage of those from a technical engineering like implementation? Yeah, I think it has been on the roadmaps many, many years. All power players are 
using wide band gap or um, are pursuing wide band gap technologies. The big players also manufacture them. Not everybody has all in its portfolio, but the two big things which are uh, of obvious interest are gallium nitride and silicon carbide. Starting with the second one, silicon carbide is not really new to the industry. As always, there's a huge amount of R&D which needs to be done before you get the first production-worthy devices. And the silicon carbide history started on our side, on Infineon's side, timing-wise, very similar to the other innovator, which is Wolfspeed. Um, at that point in time, still the Cree Wolfspeed. So a bit more than 20 years ago, both of those companies brought the first silicon carbide dial to the market. And what needs to be understood is then, of course, at that point in time, cost position was very challenging because the silicon carbide challenge is, among other things, the base material. So silicon carbide manufacturing, material manufacturing, it's a challenge on its own. And the diameter is, the wafer diameter is much, much smaller compared to silicon and also was much smaller at that point in time and therefore giving us a challenge on the cost position. But nevertheless, for this high-end niche, the silicon carbide diode uh, was a meaningful device. But as technology progresses, wafer diameter becomes larger. Today, we talk on silicon carbide for silicon carbide for six-inch wafer diameter, while on silicon, as said, we are on 12-inch, uh, 300 millimeter. Yeah. And not only the cost is being reduced due to the diameter, increasing manufacturing productivity, but also a couple of years ago, the silicon carbide MOSFET was introduced. It was also very tricky because gate oxide reliability and defect density topics are premature or are much, much more challenging also today compared to silicon technology. But nevertheless, it is meanwhile able, to, we are meanwhile, the industry is able to manufacture these devices with a high performance and also at reasonable cost. They are significantly more expensive compared to leading silicon devices, but they also provide additional performance, additional value. Why, why are the yields lower? Is it a finicky material or is it you know, something in the process that makes it harder to produce? You mentioned defects and, and wafer size. Yeah, I, I like to make the comparison that silicon carbide is on the material side where silicon um, was maybe 30, 40 years ago. So it's indeed uh, the crystal growth process of silicon carbide, which is a process running with um, roughly 1,000 de degrees C more compared to silicon. Wow. The material which is being generated has simply more defects. So from the very beginning of manufacturing, you have to handle a wafer which, which has a higher defectivity. Yeah? And um, Infineon pursues a multi-supplier strategy, so it's independent from which supplier you purchase the wafer. You always see that the defectivity, of course, varies, but it's significantly above the level that we are used from the silicon area. And so this is tricky by its own because these defects sometimes are harmless, but sometimes they also affect, affect reliability and long-term stability of the devices. Oh. And it's a tricky learning to test this appropriately out also to base or maybe adapt the process accordingly that these defects are um, not affecting the long-term device quality and performance. Okay. Sounds like some PhD opportunities there for folks. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Interesting. If you like, a short comment also to the gallium nitride topic. Absolutely. The interesting thing is that silicon, from the silicon MOSFET, you go from a couple of volts, blocking voltage, up to 6,500 6, volt, which is in our case the highest blocking voltage, which we do achieve then with IGBTs. So based, basically on the same material, but of course different technologies, MOSFET IGBTs, you can cover the full range of voltages which are used in the industry of power semiconductors. So for silicon carbide, uh, according to the nature of the material and the wide band gap of um, more than three electron volts, you can of course go also up the way up to easily 6.5 kV and maybe even more if this is required from the application from the customer. Gallium nitride is now the other material. It, it's um, another tricky challenge. 
While the silicon carbide device, as explained, is being grown on bulk silicon carbide wafers, gallium nitride is again uh, using the silicon as a substrate layer. So the tricky thing for gallium nitride is now that you deposit gallium nitride layers, a multitude of these layers, on top of a silicon wafer. And due to the specific properties of the material, you um, generate highly mobile two-dimensional electron gas, as it's called. And here you have a lateral current flow and the device on top of the bulk gallium nitride wafer conducts then with a MOSFET-like structure the current um, and you are able to switch. The limitation today for this technology in high-volume manufacturing is that the blocking voltage typically goes up to 6, 600, 650 volts. <laughs> of course, there are also concepts which think about going to 1,000 or maybe 1,200 volts blocking voltage. But this is another challenge. Yeah. So um, you can address now with wide band gap the high voltage range, and there predominantly silicon carbide is being used. And for the below 1,000 volt range, namely up to 600, 650 volts, which is the typical voltage used by switchmore power supplies, for example, their gallium nitride offers um, very interesting opportunities due to the high mobility and the excellent conduction properties of the material. Yeah, it, it blows my mind. I, I, rem I still remember the first time someone was asking about like trying to probe one of these with an oscilloscope. It was like 600 volts at 50 kilohertz, and I, I thought they were joking because of <laughs> the speeds and the voltages. The, the things that the, these technologies can do are, is incredible. Exactly. And it's also very fascinating to see how also then application and system engineers uh, learn together with us, providing the devices while we walk. And it's very challenging also then to predict the, the acceptance, um, meaning also then the growth rates. And now speaking for, for, for me and for us, I think in the recent years, we rather underestimated the potential why I would say it's not anymore the case. I would, together with the customers, we understand, we have understood and still, of course, understand what the potential of these technologies is, which now, of course, nicely is combined by the huge um, demand and growth trends of, of, the, of the economic environment, meaning e-mobility, infrastructure, renewables, all these nice applications which provide uh, the opportunity or which demand for much, much more power semiconductors than in the past. Yeah. There was a moment, I understand, where you tried to acquire Cree and Wolfspeed, who you mentioned earlier. Could you briefly give me kind of an overview of how that went? <laughs> yeah, that will be very brief <laughs> because <laughs> uh, we thought it's a good idea. And I would say hindsight, it was a really good idea yeah. since we had already some experience um, out of the international rectifier acquisition. And of course, also very good relationships and a huge team in the US. We were convinced that this would be also doable um, because we agreed on the deal. And then, of course, we need to have the um, okay. We need to have it okayed by the authorities. And it caught us a bit by surprise that this okay was not given. <laughs> so the governmental authorities obviously denied this. Uh, this um, take over and that's it because it's typically never explained yeah. <laughs> why it doesn't work uh, i cannot uh, i can only guess but i don't want to guess <laughs> and fair don't, enough <laughs> don't want to make any false statements of course the disappointment was big on our side i'm sure because we of course also much very much valued in such kind of m&a process right you you get to know these guys the other guys mm -hmm. whom you want to acquire and we were very much convinced of the competence and, and also, uh, yeah, we were convinced that it's a very nice fit also from a culture perspective um, with Infineon. Mm. I think it was a, a mutual respect that we developed over the time. So disappointment was, was big on both sides. But for us, it was very clear that even now, without having this deal Make, making it happen, um, we we were very clear that we anyway have to go this way. Yeah. So we doubled down based on our own competence, based on our own resources. And it would, of course, 
it would have accelerated our way into silicon carbide but i think uh, nevertheless we are quite happy where we stand today and and how we managed this challenge in the last couple of years yeah you've clearly gotten there can you tell me a little bit about the silicon trench mosfet technology versus planar technology i think that's also part of the story that we realized while being very early in the silicon carbide diet we were a bit late regarding the MOSFET. Mm. And why we then realized that in this case, Cree, Wolfspeed was ahead of us regarding the planar MOSFET. We could, of course, also from a technical capability do then another planar MOSFET. But we thought that while we are a bit late, let's, let's start with a more advanced concept, which is the trench MOSFET. And as we all know, the physics is the same, even if the material is different. <laughs> also today on the silicon MOSFET, the high volume MOSFETs are all trench MOSFETs. While still, of course, there's a legacy on planar, the leading edge MOSFETs are trench. And therefore we thought it's a good idea regarding cost performance and competitiveness to focus on the trench. And it was a challenge, definitely in the beginning, bringing this then, then into the market, given all these reliability topics I mentioned, which are true for planar and trench as well. So you have to make your learnings, but we are now very advanced and are manufacturing it now since many years in high volume. We are ramping it as fast as we can. So volume is simply limited by our ramp speed. Hmm. We are on our way to now bring a huge manufacturing facility in Kulim dedicated for white band gap, i.e. silicon carbide and gallium nitride, up and running. So first wafer will be started, manufacturing productive wafers will be started then next year. While until then, we are ramping our existing facilities as fast as we can. It sounds like there's a physical difference between the two. Could you briefly give you an overview of what makes trench technology trench technology? As the name is granted by the trench, of course, it's clear that you have to etch um, a trench inside the device. And, and that's basically the main difference. While for the planar MOSFET, you deposit the oxide on the surface and the, the gate, and then, of course, adding the implants and the contacts. Mm. And the thing for the trench is slightly more complex. The point is that you have then the ability, you are rewarded Having in having a better shrinkability. So you're able to shrink the device ah. even if you increase the blocking voltage. Of course, different applications and different customers require different voltages. So for the planar device, you can, of course, also improve the performance and optimizing, optimizing the gate oxide, getting more RDS on uh, out of the device. So lowering the RDS on. But if you have to play around with the gate oxide, it always becomes quite tricky regarding liability, reliability. And you have to find ways to balance failure rates, fit rates, DPM rates, uh, while, of course, you want to increase the performance. Yeah. The trench device offers a certain additional degrees of freedoms where you simply improve, we are able to improve the performance, not compromising on reliability and quality. Okay. You buy this with a certain complexity, as you have to etch the trench and as you have then to deposit the oxide um, in the trench, but it turns out to be very competitive. So my understanding, right, if RDS is high, then you lose efficiency and you have more heat. And if it's low, it's more efficient and runs cooler. Exactly. Cool, uh, no pun intended. What other considerations come to mind? Yeah, one thing which comes to my mind, the thing is, of course, uh, we tend to focus on, on the device performance for good reasons. The other thing which needs to be understood is the reliability of the product. And of course, it's always the, the, the chip mm. inside a package. Yeah. And while we talk about package and uh, talk about increasing performance, meaning typically higher current densities, um, the, the reliability of the whole product is determined by how you, get, how you can handle the heat, how you get the heat out of the package and what the ideas are to, of course, keep the level of failure rates pretty low while increasing the power density. And that's a topic which should not be underestimated. Of course, also the leading players in the industry are behind that and looking into it. 
But that's also a topic where I would say leading players are able to master this together, of course, with customers and find the best ways to increase the performance while also looking into this this temperature and, and heating budget, which is a tricky thing. Also, in certain areas, this might limit the usability of ever-increasing power density and higher currents. So you get the current out of the device without overheating, and you need to find solutions which are, of course, acceptable also from the application perspective. And that's a very interesting and tricky thing, which we always have to look at and, and shouldn't underestimate and shouldn't forget. Yeah, I'm convinced packaging engineers are some of the unsung heroes of the, the chip world, especially if we're talking about like kilowatts here. I, I couldn't agree more. What's the current state of the renewables energy industry? Not everybody is aware of that the huge increase in competitiveness um, from the renewables comes, of course, from the whole overall system. So one topic we discussed a bit was the increasing performance of the solar module, which is important and, and a valid, valid point. But the other thing is, of course, the overall system cost, including the inverter. And that's another extremely impressive improvement that we can observe there here over, over the last 15 years or so. I, I looked into the data, our data, and also the customer data. And just to give you an, an idea, talking about a 100 kilowatt inverter in 2008, such a machine had a weight of about one ton. Wow. So you need a huge crane to, to move this thing 100 kilowatt. Today, the, the same weight, divide this by 10, you end up with 100 kg. And such a machine today converts energy in the area of 350 kilowatts. So that's an improvement by more than times 30 regarding the kilowatts per kg, which you can to a certain extent, of course, translate into cost because you save a huge amount of material. So that's one of the other reasons why the competitiveness of renewable generated energy in this example, PV, but same is true for wind, by the way, has come down significantly. And so um, it's a very obvious thing that this leads then further to... Um, huge increase in demand because it's simply the most competitive way to generate electricity today. Yeah, every year, I think this is going to be the year I put solar panels on my house, but <laughs> the cost always comes down a little more every year. It gets more and more compelling. Yeah, but don't wait too long, at least for Europe and Germany. Now the situation is, as said, right, that the energy prices massively increase. <laughs> and yeah. now all the installers are completely overrun because the demand is exploding. <laughs> Where will the, the world of renewable energy be, in your opinion, in, in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? Where, where do you think we're going? So it's simply following... The, the curves, and these are exponential curves that we now already see today. And now, especially PV is overtaking each and every source of energy being generated regarding the growth trajectory because of the competitiveness. To put this a bit in numbers, because I recently did the math myself. So I put on my very small roof, which I had um, only now um, something like 15 years ago, I put a very, very small PV generator on it. At that point in time, it, it costs a small fortune, not a big one, because it was a very small, <laughs> small system. <laughs> um, and it generates now since 15 years without any service, continuously energy. If I do the math regarding this rather high price that I had to pay for the whole installation, I am producing electricity, assuming the system will run for 20 years, 50 years or 15 already gone, so another five years to go, right? Then it will produce the electricity for something like 30, 30 cents per kilowatt hour. If I now today purchase here electricity, I pay something like 50 cents. So it makes a lot of sense. If I now buy a new system and put it on my roof, I generate the electricity for 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Because now I have another roof, I'm doing this um, exercise now <laughs> again, but I'm also in the trap that nobody's able and, and, and willing to install because mm. <laughs> everybody is um, sold out. That is yeah. only for a small rooftop system. If you talk about um, utility scale or commercial scale system, 
Um, and if you're not now in the, the south of Germany, but maybe in Italy, then we talk about single cents per kilowatt hour already today. Wow. And so, I mean, you can go now down from nine to six to three to two cents. Uh, and then, of course, it's, it, it limits. But giving those numbers and the dynamic, the logic is that simply the volume will exponentially increase, continue to exponentially increase for the years to come until end of this decade. And I dare to predict until end of next decade. Because the hunger for energy and electricity continues to increase yes. with global population, not to underestimate that in certain highly populated areas, the access to electricity is still very limited. So very obvious, it's the cheapest source of electricity generation already today. It's very easy to install. It's decentral. So I predict simply to a market which continues to explode. Also, all the skeptics regarding renewables then start to yeah. discuss about um, the predictability and the storabilities, how to store the energy and the electricity. And I think this is a fair point. This needs to be overcome. And of course, solar generated electricity will not heal the world alone. So we need to combine it. Um, wind, for example, as said, that also means that we need significant investments into the grid, being able to transmit the energy because it's sometimes generated. For example, wind energy is generated um, on the sea where the wind is typically yeah. blowing much, much more than on the countryside. And then, of course, you need to transport um, the energy, the electricity to where it's needed. That is one topic. And the other thing is storage. And the storage thing is, of course, also a very interesting topic, which nicely also connects to the e-mobility, which is now kicking in to uh, reduce our CO2 emissions. And these are other topics which are very nice playgrounds for engineers and technologists. And we need to put, of course, a lot of effort into developing these things further. But significant progress is there. And also the investments are there. So that's clearly the way to go. And it's fascinating to be able to accompany the society to go this way. If the, the need is there and the funding's there, it seems like a ripe opportunity. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, at the end of every episode, we like to do a lightning round. Some, some quick questions with quick answers. They may or may not be related. Um, you worked a lot with flash memory, but if you were the superhero of the flash and you could run back in time, where would you run to? Um, I would... Um... I would be much, much faster regarding decision-making and execution on those things which um, obviously generate competitive advantage and technology. Okay, good answer. And for the superhero fans listening, I, if I got that wrong, maybe it's an alternate universe. Don't, don't come at me on social. <laughs> if you could go back to the 90s with what you know now about solar energy, is there anything you would have told the PV industry experts that would have accelerated you know, development and adoption of solar? No, I think I would have invested differently <laughs> myself privately. <laughs> but the inter interesting thing is you, you can tell whatever you want, right? The thing is that um, you have to execute then accordingly and you have to learn why you walk. And um, looking back hindsight, I would say uh, no big mistakes, no things where I would say now from today's perspective, I would have uh, said something completely different. It evolved in a way which I think is very nice, um, but it was to that extent not foreseeable. Now today we know better. Fair enough. Are there any semiconductor uh, materials that get you excited today that are not necessarily practical now, but in the future might be interesting? Yeah, I think it's um, fascinating now to be part of this transition regarding silicon carbide and gallium nitride. It took a long time and so for me, it's the learning and now uh, watch out, look out what's the next thing to come, gallium, gallium oxide and a couple of other things who, who might be upcoming and interesting. But a general statement, I would say don't underestimate material science and the progress driven by material science. That's one of the things I love about the side of electrical engineering is there's so much chemistry and physics and material science that plays into it. It's not just you know, dragging wires or moving bits around. There's, there's so much interesting stuff happening. 
Uh, last question. You're part of what could be an electrical engineering dynasty. <laughs> your, your dad was an electrical engineer and you have your know, kids studying. As you look back on the field and your, your time in EE, what encouragement would you give to people who are considering their career in the space or are early in their careers? Um, I would very much encourage them to go for engineering, to embrace the opportunities. It's uh, f First of all, it's of a very high demand and it's a fascinating topic where simply you can innovate and um, develop things to the greater good and, and make, make use of it also for society. And I think it's very rewarding tackling the, the issues and the challenges that we face to, today, also from a societal topic, meaning global warming, the reduction of CO2 emissions, etc. Of course, there are un un other engineering jobs which are likewise fascinating, but I would encourage everybody who thinks about going there because it's also a very creative part, very dynamic, and yeah, since much more than 20 years has been very fascinating until today for me. Well, thank you so much for being here. This was a blast. Daniel, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Well, that's it for today. If you like this podcast, come check us out on the Moore's Lobby social pages. And while you're there, tag someone who you think will like it too. When you share this show with other people, it is the highest compliment. But if that's not enough, we're also giving away swag for the tag. That is, tag those folks you think will like the show on the Moore's Lobby posts, and we'll send you some swag. That is it for today. Please make sure you're subscribed in your favorite podcast delivery mechanism. If you're this deep in the interview and haven't subscribed, that'd be a little bit crazy. Crazy. Anyways, I'm your host, Daniel Bogdanov. Thank you for joining me today in the lobby. May your RDS on be negligibly close to zero and your RDS off be practically infinity. Catch you next time. Mm -hmm.